we were approached last fall uh, by Fran Faraz, whose enthusiasm was so contagious that we got it instantly. And uh, I wanted to thank especially President Wes Bryan and all of the uh, individuals from Valerie Venegas to Suzanne Gonzalez um, for helping to put this together, your sustainability club, all the students of this school, and all of you who cope with Southern California. Um, I actually feel very heartened that although the title of this conference is A Better Tomorrow, uh, I, I believe that it's a better today. And I, think, I, and I thank all of you for your participation and your interest and your commitment to making peace happen today at the end of this first decade of the 21st century. Um, because certainly it is our privilege and it is our duty to apply the principles of kindness and nonviolence now in all aspects of our lives towards one another, towards all other living creatures. Um, and I'm just very grateful to be here today. Thank you. So on that note, we're going to tell two stories. Um, if we could dim these lights. We can. I think we can, yeah. Mark's going to. I don't know. We can't dim the outside lights, nor would we dare want to, of course. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to show you about 100 images in about an eight to nine minute time frame, starting with the first, allegedly, the first signed garden ever created in Kyoto at, at Royanji. Um, and we're not going to give any kind of running commentary on these images, which come from countries around the world, which Jane and I have photographed. But um, they tell their own story, and then we'll retell the story in a different way. That's the Supreme Court on the upper left in Washington. that that shot on the upper left is the heart of winter in Warsaw. And that this cheetah had its back deliberately broken by a person we won't refer to so that it couldn't escape captivity. These two burrows on the upper left are on the island of Socotra in Yemen, in the Indian Ocean. We were fortunate to rediscover this species, which had been deemed extinct since the 1880s. It's Equus asinus somaliensis. This is not a telephoto. They'd never seen a human being when I took this shot. Just standing next to them, they were completely at ease. Oh, this is 
I forgot how timely this is. The upper left shot is from Bahrain. Shot on the top there is the Pacific Pocket Mouse down at uh, Camp Pendleton. It's the rarest mammal in North America. Has the unfortunate circumstance of competing for three acres of habitat, which is its sole remaining habitat on Earth, with five to ten million dollar estates just down the coast here. There's a few hundred left. It's been outfitted with the smallest transmitter ever created 0.05 grams to try to determine how we can hopefully save this species from extinction. That's the rarest parrot in the world, the kakapo. There's 126 left present. If you've driven up the California coast in Big Sur, you may have seen a shot like this on the left, the California condor. And this uh, shot at the bottom right is not a setup for a TV program. This is a house in Salisbury, which is an animal sanctuary. And that's uh, Michael Aufhauser at home, doing what he does best. Entertaining his friends. <laughs> Guess who's coming to dinner. <laughs> That's a story told um, that began with images of the primordial and continuing miraculous perfection that is the creation that is this earth. Uh, it quickly went into recreations in the case of Japanese miniaturization of gardens and then a renaissance image by Jan Bruegel the Elder creating a painting, one of many he did with Rubens, of Adam and Eve in paradise. And after that, um, tension started to evolve in the case of some primates that you saw that are quite rare and endangered. And then suddenly images of um, very crowded megacities from Jakarta to Tokyo. And after that, you saw countless images of species, many rare, threatened, critically endangered, right on the cusp of going extinct. Um, and in the end, several images of individuals who were working day and night, 24-7, to save every living creature they possibly can, including members of our own species. And let's think of that in terms of the title of our little talk here today, which is Biodiversity, Democracy, and Nonviolence. We conjoin these three terms, phrases, because democracy, a very ancient word, uh, arguably coming from Greece in the fifth century when the population of Athens, her capital, uh, if we are to listen to Aristotle, was around 5,000. Other historians say it was closer to 200,000. That gap in understanding demography suggests and mirrors contemporary mismatches between scientific data, human perception, public policy, and the life of individuals of every species. Um, science is one form of interpretation of the universe, of course, and it's been a very potent one for a long time. But just in the last two decades, uh, scientists who work in the natural history fields 
have seen the projected number of species go up by a factor of, of exponentially two. So what started as a million five to 1.8 million cataloged species, and it's just that, it's a catalog card basically, a digital chip, a recognition of a specific type of DNA. We now estimate there are well over 100 million species on this planet. Every one of those species on average contains possibly as many on average again as 3 million individuals. Do the math. We're talking about a large number of life forms out there. And one of the common, perhaps the most common denominator, aside from the sheer majesty and beauty and sovereignty of each and every individual, is the fact that we're all vulnerable to pain. We all suffer. We all must endure whatever circumstances are thrown at us. And we have the great challenge in this generation, the, the duty, to give back, to do everything we can to ameliorate the suffering. Buddha said life is suffering. Mahavira, the, the great sage of the Jain tradition, pretty much concurred with that and acknowledged that every living creature, even the 22 billion bacteria in my armpit, the 7 million on average, follicle mites in your eyelashes all have an individual soul that needs to be respected. With those kinds of numbers, what is particularly troubling right now with respect to a democracy and the choices that a democracy invokes are the choices we will make ethically in this generation today because we have lots of choices at our disposal. We can choose to do virtually anything. And our choices will dictate the future of evolution on planet Earth. If you choose to be violent through indifference, through apathy, through simply turning away because it's either too much work, too complicated, too overwhelming, that's a choice you make. If you choose to dive headlong into the fray, notwithstanding the odds against perhaps making the change you wish to see in the world, at least you've tried. Or if, like the two of us here, Jane and myself, you're a prob probabilist, somewhere between optimism and cynicism, and you really do believe, as I think you should, that you will and you can and you must make a great change then we will save species from extinction. We will save the 42,000 odd populations that are going extinct every day, a much bigger problem. We'll recognize that every, every choice we make has echoes that are serious and significant ecologically and that the biological bottom line is that which will either make or break our species and millions of others co-dependent with us in this generation. Years ago, I was with Manika Gandhi, then the Minister of Forest and Environment in New Delhi, in India, and we were talking about the fate of the tiger. And at that time, this is back in about 1995, uh, there were estimated to be about 1,200 tigers left in India, about 7,000 left in all of the world. And Monica said to me, as I mentioned, the next generation, the children of the future, and she got very angry with me, and she said, forget the future. Forget the children. Now, we have to act right now. The tigers have no hope if we don't act right now. Don't lay it off on your children. And that struck me with potent force because she's absolutely right and that Pacific pocket mouse you saw up there um, whose sole survival depends on congressionally mandated American public choice that Marines not only go to places like Iraq and Afghanistan but they protect mice at Camp Pendleton just down the road here and Colonel Seaton who was the commander of the base at that time 
uh, when that shot was taken a couple of years ago, he said very proudly, standing on top of a cliff where we were filming him in a project called Hot Spots, he says, we take it very seriously that there are nearly 20 critically endangered species at this marine base. In fact, we take it as critically important to American culture, to the future of the planet, as we do the other tasks that the 100,000 family members and servicemen and women at Camp Pendleton are, in, are enduring on behalf of the freedoms that we all enjoy here today. Nikos Kazantzakis, the great Greek poet, philosopher, traveler, writer, who's best known for his novel Zorba the Greek, starring Anthony Quinn in the film remake, said a few beautiful lines among tens of thousands of lines. He said, after he came down from Mount Athos in Greece in the middle of winter, following a 40-day sojourn, he found in this little courtyard at the base of the cliff an almond tree. In the middle of winter, very cold, there was snow up on the mountain. And he writes that he walked up to the almond tree and he said, Sister, speak to me of God. And the almond tree blossomed. He also said, I'm a mortal. I'm a mortal being. But God, when I go, please take me by the longest possible route. And at the end of one of his great novels, St. Francis, he made a very interesting statement. He said, if every one of us were St. Francis, there would be no need for St. Francis. Very provocative points, because on the compass, on the atlas of our heart, we wake up every day and we know we are surrounded by violence. And we know that the challenge of nonviolence grows more substantially by the minute. There are formally over 120 rebel groups at this very hour. We're fighting civil wars across the planet. There are so many wildfires breaking out, erupting ecologically, biologically, that we don't know where to turn first in terms of priorities. But the one thing that I think was beautifully stated earlier was the gecko hypothesis. I like that very much. And I think if, as Albert Schweitzer himself said, you are willing to be condemned as a sentimentalist, then you're on the right track. It means that you could spend a whole day following an ant at play. It means you could spend months and lose yourself in a forest. You could spend years and lose yourself on the leaf of every manuscript, which was the book that John Muir described as Yosemite. I'm going to turn it over to Jane for a while. You're on a roll, but I have one thing to add, inspired by Mark Lee's reference to observing the gecko, which is so beautiful and so apt. We're surrounded here by, we're surrounded here by students, by educators, by inspired scholars. And I sometimes wonder, in the photograph of me that you see in the bio, I'm with an orangutan in central Borneo. We were with Urute Gandakas, who took us on an amazing journey through her world and the world of the orangutan and the other creatures who inhabit, who still inhabit those forests. I wonder sometimes if our best teachers, if our best mentors, aren't our human companions, but those creatures that we meet in the forest who show only kindness, love, and generosity. And I don't just speak of an orangutan, 
who is not a meat eater, but I grew up in the Santa Monica Mountains, and I played with, believe it or not, a pack of coyotes as a child. I never felt fear. I was, obviously I wasn't in peril. I'm here. As part of nature and the natural world, I think it's important to extend our loving hearts and generosity to all of those creatures who inhabit this forest with us and share this wonderful world that we hope to see endure in the today, not merely the tomorrow. Let's take questions. I have a friend that goes to Costa Rica every year for the environmental tourism, and I was wondering if you could talk on the topic. Should we be asking tens of thousands of people to go to all of these sensitive places across the world and be explorers like yourself? What are your views? This is a double bind. This is really a double bind. We did a film together some years ago, early in our relationship, friendship, and collaboration. And it was about this very subject. It was about um, ecotourism in Antarctica. And what we observed was that the ecotourists were permitted to get, in our view, in our opinions, far too close to the wildlife, whom we were all there to admire. Um, on the other hand, I do think that there are tremendous benefits to ecotourism because I think it provides a sustainable living for indigenous peoples. It helps people to celebrate, it teaches people to celebrate nature in the natural world. I have not been to Costa Rica. Michael, you have. What are your thoughts about that? Well, a recent study came out a few weeks ago from the Nature Conservancy in England where they examined 400 allegedly sustainable win-win situations for indigenous peoples of which there's over 350 million left on the planet at last count so to speak and the different mechanisms whether clean development mechanisms under united nations red and cap and trade and other forms of income generation for indigenous peoples as well as those of us who are not so-called indigenous living in mega cities and out of the 400 projects only two were deemed to work. Very discouraging news. Much of it was hinged on ecotourism. I wrote a piece a few weeks ago you can read online in Forbes about ecotourism as one of the bubbles and I looked at the Maldives as an example. And as I'm sure most of you know, the Maldives will probably be one of the first nations in the world to disappear because of climate change. The entire revenue stream of that country currently hinges upon ecotourism, five-star hotels, and people of all uh, financial persuasions flocking there to see some of the last great underwater <coughs> ecosystems on the planet. Tragically, the 110,000 or so people in Mali, the Islamic capital, democratic capital of the Maldives, um, is right on the edge of going underwater. The, the president has been sending billions of dollars in a trust fund to Sri Lanka because he knows the entire population of that country is going to have to leave their homeland very soon. Ecotourism bubbles are just that. They are bubbles. Um, we've seen in Madagascar, in northern Brazil, on Easter Island, which is now Chile, um, examples where it can work. The top-down issue is where the revenue is going and what level and significant participation is taking place by the people there who are doing their best to not only save indigenous wildlife but to share their own love and enthusiasm and expert systems if you will with people like ourselves who visit these extraordinary places but let's put that in context costa rica is the only country in the world to answer your question that has actually found a mechanism by which indigenous people can be compensated realistically in this economy for not cutting down primary forests. There's no other country in the world with the exception of Bhutan in the Himalayas 
that has managed that and one other country there was an image you saw of a person in tennis shoes on a cliff over a huge forest that's Suriname which still has 95 percent of its tropical rainforests intact um, there aren't too many other examples like that so if you if you think you're going on an ecotourist vacation or a study abroad program or some kind of outing involving the transfer of money where you've been told that money is going to go to an indigenous group there's a lot of questions you might want to think about asking whoever's leading that trip whatever organization is leading that trip number one nutritional illiteracy among young girls are young girls being oppressed? Are they getting the same educational benefits as their male counterparts? Are they getting the same amount of food at the dinner table as their male counterparts? You may want to find out about clear-cutting, secondary versus tertiary forest, and what that forest is being cut down for, and what species in particular are being afflicted. You may want to do some research and homework as to what endemic species are there. And the best way to find all of that on one easy website is Population Reference Bureau, PRB, where you'll see about 100 different indices relating to family health, demography, population issues, total fertility rates, national uh, reproductive rates, which relate specifically to girls, young girls. A lot of questions you need to ask before you just willy-nilly go on a vacation and call it ecotourism. However, having said all that, no. we still highly recommend it. Because you're well, no, because I everyone do, in this room is an expert. I do think that it's it's a benefit for all of us to have contact with other cultures. With by culture, I'm not referring merely to human culture, by the way. Um, and I do think that there is a likely boon to the people living in those places which we visit, to a greater or lesser degree. Other question. How do we get the people to prioritize a sustainable earth and biodiversity over money? Well, the two are not necessarily at odds. And the Clinton Initiative and the, the oath, charity oath of the world's billionaires, that's now very much at play. Warren Buffett and, and Bill Gates having just gone to India to talk with the 80 wealthiest individuals in that country to try to unleash the power of money to help nature, to help human nature and all other natures. Um, they're not incompatible. This notion that multinationals are bad, that the financial markets are bad, that the values associated with capitalism are bad, I think is, um, is muddled thinking. There are bad aspects to everything I just mentioned, for sure, hugely. Uh, horrendous aspects. On the other hand, we've developed a global currency amongst at least 6.2, 6.3 billion homo sapiens uh, who are not on the barter system and who do use financial currencies as indices of value. So my recommendation in thinking about that very good question is to work out in your own heart how you reconcile giving, philanthropy, uh, gestures of selflessness in the natural world and in the human community. What is very encouraging to me is to see groups of six and seven and eight year olds who are philanthropic. And let's not forget in 1989 the Montreal Protocol on stratospheric ozone was really prompted by a nine-year-old girl who wrote a letter to the CEO of DuPont worried about her horse, her red pony. She put the connection together that somehow ozone depletion could kill her red pony. 
And that little letter was apparently so poignantly received as to have created one of the best treaties and most quickly adopted treaties ever. There's the example of a 13-year-old Canadian lad who went to Asia and started a march to protest human rights violations amongst kids, and he got millions of followers. There's the Swedish example of a young boy at a school who started passing around the hat to all of his peers in school, in grade school, to raise money at a time when you could buy an acre in the Amazon for one US dollar. And they raised over a million dollars and they've saved over a million acres of habitat. And let me finally just put that really in dynamic perspective. In 1998, Terry Irwin and colleagues from the Smithsonian Institution went to Yasuna National Park in eastern Ecuador and did some groundbreaking research. They found that on one tree, there were over 60,000 species dependent on that one tree. You go a hectare down to 0.4 acres away from that one tree, 60,000 different species. We are living in such, we are living in such biodiverse circumstances that everything we touch has ramifications. Every word we utter, every intention, every thought has deep resonance on this planet. This is why in the Jain tradition, you must really think before you speak. Restraint is everything. Humility and modesty are not just words. They're deeply religious, spiritual, meaningful concepts. And our ability as a species to revere and celebrate nature through this art that we see surrounding us today. Maybe the key to our survival as a species. Our celebration of nature may be key to our survival as a species. Any other questions? Gosh, we're getting off easy. <laughs> Um, would, it, would it be correct to um, ask the question that, that it, while we can do negative impact to the earth, uh, that saving nature could be <coughs> more to the human interest than people realize, because it, it seems to me that if the Earth can survive uh, asteroid that was 10 times the size of Mount Everest, and the Earth could survive that, it could survive humans, you know, and that, that really, it's, it's a matter of our own you know, our own place that, it, that we don't want to, we don't want to be harmful bacteria. You know, that it's, it's, it's more a matter of, I mean, the, I'm sorry, I think I lost my question. <laughs> Are you suggesting that the, for example, five great extinctions that have occurred in the past, some of them by colliding objects outside our solar system, well, well, yeah, survived but, by the Earth? Y yes, but what I'm saying is that, that could it be that our, our own preservation of the Earth could be the preservation of ourselves, meaning that, I mean, there, there, I just, I just, you look at the way an immune system, an immune system works, you know, if we become too <laughs> detrimental, I don't think the earth would have any problem, 
you know, you know, saying, okay, that's it for you. So, I mean, if we have this consciousness about ourselves, it's not, not to sound, you know, too self-absorbed, but I mean, really, this, this is ultimately a matter of our own, you know, survival and preserving our home. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, not to, not to say that it's all about human survival, because as I said, the Earth will survive, but I mean, really, there is, I can't really form my question, but I, I yeah. Well, I think that the Earth will likely survive uh, with or without us. Uh, we may not be part of the equation unless we take action today. Obviously, we're acting in our own interest by caring for this world, but we don't exist outside of nature. We are part of, we are part of the big picture. Um, so yes, the Earth might survive without us, but we will not survive unless we protect the nature that surrounds us and supports us. Well, and, and let's just remember the big difference. I mean, you've read the headlines, you see them every day. The sixth extinction spasm in the annals of biology, 4.1 billion plus years that's occurring right now. Let's remember that this extinction, which we alone have inflicted on the Earth, is different than any other extinction that's ever occurred. And that's because it's happening overnight in biological time. Other, other extinctions took, in some cases, millions of years to take place. It gave time for genetics to adapt. It gave time for behavior to change. We are losing, at last count this year, 42,000 populations every day. We are adding to the planet one Chicago every three weeks. There are now 1.2 billion individuals who are going to bed hungry. You read this data, and as Boutros Boutros Ghali once said, there is the risk of compassion fatigue. We lose sense of where we stand amid such staggering numbers and prospects. But I'd just like to conclude on that note that the the valuation of nature, which is a very clumsy computation at best, is somewhere in the order of 33 trillion per year of free services from nature, or 10 times this year's budget in the United States. And that's just an absolute guess. How do you place any value on fresh drinking water if you've gone five days without any water? How do you place value on oxygen if you've just gone six minutes without any oxygen to your blood system? How do you place value on this person versus that person? On this person versus this person? On the joy of seeing a tree squirrel. How, I sometimes wonder how I would feel if I, could, if I were to wake up and know that I would never see a robin or a tree squirrel, or a pollinator. Friend, well, we, we wouldn't last long. A friend of ours, a friend, but. just one last point, it's very interesting. A very close friend of ours who now lives in Singapore grew up in a jungle estate in Assam in Northeast India. I asked her, Radha, well, how do you like Singapore? She married a Dutch architect, they have a nice life there. She did point out one disturbing fact about life in Singapore. She said, I just don't get the laws in this country. They do not allow kids to build tree houses. I thought about that. And I said, you're kidding. She said, no. It's illegal to build a tree house. Kids cannot climb trees in Singapore. And this takes us back to the adventures of Dr. Doolittle and to the childhood in all of us. And it's that childhood which, as Dostoevsky put it beautifully in one of his novels, we all live a few minutes of our lives and spend the rest of our lives trying to recapture those moments of miraculous joy and unfettered imaginative embrace of this universe. So I guess I'm urging all of you to recover your childhood as soon as possible. Go with it. 
and uh, let it take you wherever it will. Thanks. All right.